So getting on with the regular talk today, uh, the goal for this talk is to introduce you to the concept of charge and to familiarize you with a lot of the support circuitry that has to go around a charge pump to make it work. Now, if you're, if you're not familiar with a charge pump or haven't heard of it before, it's a type of DC to DC converter, and it uses capacitors as energy storage elements. Unlike buck and boost converters, there's no inductors. So a typical charge pump is used to create on-chip voltages that are either higher than the supply or lower than the supply. So if you need a voltage and it's not available external, you can use this charge pump concept to generate it. A simple one-stage charge pump is shown here, and its job is to produce an output voltage that's higher than VDD. For now, let's just assume all these diodes are ideal. And by ideal, I mean there's no voltage in the forward direction, you know, infinite breakdown, no leakage current, perfect one-way valves. So if we have an incoming clock signal, it drives the lower plate of capacitor C1 up and down. And the upper plate of capacitor C1 is going to try to follow that voltage across the cap. The cap wants to keep that voltage the same. So let's assume node 1, V1, V1 here starts at ground. Node 2 and node 3, they're both going to start at about VDD because we have forward biased diodes here. And again, we're assuming no, no drop in the diodes. We're assuming the bottom uh, of C1 starts at ground and the top of C1 starts at VDD. As V1 starts rising, the top of cap C1 is going to try to rise with it. It's going to try to move by the same amount. However, at some point, it's going to forward bias diode D2 here, and some of the charge that you're sending through here is going to share with capacitor C2. Therefore, the voltage on V2 and V3 are going to rise, but they're not going to rise by the same amount as V1 because you're sharing the charge between the two of them. Now, as V1 comes back down and keeps dropping, it's going to try to pull V2 down with this. But what's going to happen is, at some point in time, Diode D1 is going to forward bias, so V2 can't drop below v, VDD. It can, it can, it's going to stop right at VDD. V3, on the other hand, you've pumped up a little bit higher than VDD, and it's going to sit there because now you have a reverse bias D2. So any charge you pumped onto cap C2 is going to stay there because it, it can't leak back off. So even though V2 is falling, the voltage on V3 uh, stays elevated, and just like I said, because diode D2 is reverse bias. Now we come along and we drive node V1 high again. Well, that's going to try to pull V2 up again, and a little bit of that charge gets pumped over onto V3. So now V3 is going to go up a little bit higher than it did before. And you repeat this over and over and over again, until the voltage on V3 actually comes up to almost twice VDD. The capacitor C1 gets charged on the falling edge of V1, and then it shares that charge with C2 on the rising edge of V1. So basically, during every clock cycle, a little packet of charge is moved from VDD onto capacitor C1 and then moves from capacitor C1 on to capacitor C2. So C1 is just acting like the middleman. So after a few clock cycles, V3 is going to approach twice VDD. Capacitor C1 is known as the flying cap. And you may have heard that terminology before. And it's the flying cap because its terminals are always moving up and down. Capacitor C2 is known as the storage cap because it's holding the charge. It's there just to hold the charge and accumulate this charge that you're pumping in on every clock cycle. Here's some animation to help clarify this concept. As the voltage on V1 and V2 uh, falls, C1 is charged from VDD through diode D1, and that's what we're showing here. A little bit of charge goes on in the cap. On the next cycle, as V1 and V2 rise, that same charge is pumped 
to capacitors P2. So if we go back and forth here, you can kind of see what's happening. On every clock cycle, a little bit of charge is moving from VDD onto the cap and then from the cap onto the output cap. So that's pretty much how it works. And that's kind of, kind of why it's called a charge pump because we're pumping little packets of charge on every clock cycle. What would the waveforms look like if we you know, just started this thing up and looked at each of these nodes? Well, of course, you know, you've got a clock signal coming in and you're inverting that clock signal on the output of this inverter. But on the top of C1, well, ideally it would like to follow the bottom side of C1, but it starts sharing that charge with C2. So at the beginning, you don't quite get the full rise at this node, but after a couple of clock cycles, C2 gets pumped all the way up to 2x VDD, and now V1 will follow and, and also go up to 2x VDD on every clock cycle. What would the steady state output waveform look like if you had a resistive load? So now we're going to add a resistive load on the output over here. V, v out rises with every little incoming charge packet. And that's, you can kind of see what's happening to V out over time here. It starts DC wise up here at 2x VDD. In between charge packets, you get this little droop, and then it gets charged again, and then it's droops and charged again. I showed it as a straight line here. It's really an RC time constant. This output waveform is known as output ripple. So if you hear the term ripple on uh, charge pump, it really means how much the output is varying with time. Generally, ripple is something you'd like to minimize. So ways to minimize it are you make the resistor bigger, you make the cap bigger, you, you clock this thing faster. There, there's a bunch of ways to make the, uh, the charge pump output ripple better. But I just wanted to communicate what that term was. Okay, so that that shows you how to create a positive voltage. What if you want to create a negative voltage, a voltage that's lower than, say, the ground on your circuit? Here's a way to do it. And all we've done here is we've just taken this and we've changed the diodes. We've flipped them in the other direction. And instead of hooking VDD here, we've hooked ground to this node. This works exactly the same way as the previous pump, only now what happens is on every cycle we pull a off of V3 onto C1, and then that charge gets pumped to ground. So eventually what happens is the voltage across capacitor C2 goes negative, goes below ground, and it'll go all the way down to minus VDD eventually if you clock this thing long enough. So charge pumps can be used for generating positive voltages and can be used for generating negative voltages. So what if you wanted to generate a voltage that's higher than just 2x VDD? Let's say you have a, a camera flash and you know, camera flashes require a lot of voltage to initiate. But you're doing this with a one and a half volt battery. So you wanna jack that one and a half volt battery up to some very high voltage that you can use for your camera flash. Just doubling it is not going to be enough. You, you want to really crank up that voltage. So you can do a, a multi-stage charge pump. And I just showed two stages here where you know, we've just added another stage of diodes and capacitors mm -hmm. here. And what this will give us instead of 2x VDD is going to get a, give us 3x VDD eventually. So by just adding extra stages to the charge pump, you can pump to a much higher voltage if you want. And you can do the same thing for negative voltages. You can do higher voltages negative, higher voltage positive. It'll, it'll work both ways. Uh, the, the, the diode charge pumps I show here are very convenient, but it, they really have a few issues. Unlike ideal diodes, real diodes tend to have forward voltage drops, and we all know it's about 0.7 volts. They leak in the reverse direction. They're not ideal. You know, that leakage current and the 0.7 volt drop can reduce the output voltage that you're trying to generate. And in, in addition, you might want to clock the charge pump at a very high frequency rate. 
you know, to reduce that ripple. And it sometimes is, it, it's difficult to clock or to charge the capacitors quickly through diodes. Diodes are going to have some uh, you know, resistance. So a, a possible solution to that is to replace these diodes with switches. This works exactly the same way as I showed before. In this case, the position of the switches is controlled by an incoming clock signal. Let's say when the clock is high, you'd have the switch position on the left side here. And when the clock went low, they would switch to the other side. And I think I explained, oh, and C1 here is, is still your flying cap, and C2 is still your storage cap. I think I showed this on the next slide. Yeah, here we go. So when the switches are in the left position, you can see cap C1 is being charged because its bottom plate is connected to ground and its top plate is connected to VDD. So it gets charged up. Then you switch and that charged cap is connected to C2, but now its bottom plate is tied to VDD. So any charge on this cap is going to elevate the voltage on C2 higher than VDD by whatever the voltage on C1 is. So you flip back and forth between these two states, it works exactly the same as the diode charge pump that we talked about. On, on every clock cycle, tap C1 gets charged, and then on the next part of the cycle, tap C1 dumps a little bit of that charge to cap C2. And the advantage of the switches are you don't have the forward drop of diodes. You can probably run this thing at higher frequency because you can make the, the R on of the switches very low. Now, the problem with switches is you have to have uh, a break before make configuration. You, you don't want any of these switches to ever overlap. And that's called a, a non-overlapping clock scheme. If both sides of, let's say this switch over here, inadvertently were closed at the same time, you'd short ground to VDD here and you'd get a lot of current. So you'd really like to open this switch before you close it on the other side. You, you never want these two switches closed at the same time. In a similar manner, you never want these two switches closed at the same time because you're trying to pump C2 up to twice VDD. And if, if these two switches closed at the same time, all that charge would get leaked off back to VDD and all that work you've spent to try to pump C2 voltage up has gone away. So you need a non-overlapping clock scheme. And let me show you how you generate that. Well, this is this is kind of what the non-overlapping clock scheme would look like. So in the, in this for this circuit to work, we need a two-phase clock. Switches that we want to open and close at the same time, we're going to gain together and we're going to control those by the same phase of the clock. The switches on the left we want to, those to open and close together, and we're going to say those are controlled by phase one. And the switches on the right, which are shown over in, in the open position in this diagram, we're going to say are going to be controlled by phase two. Let's say an individual switch will be in the on state when the associated clock phase is high. If phase one is high, we're going to say the switches on the left are on, if phase two is high, we're going to say the switches on the right are on. This is kind of what the, the phases would look like. And you can see there's a dead zone in between here where both switches are off. Phase one and phase two are both zero. So that says when we transition from charging the cap to discharging the cap into C2, there's going to be a small time lag in there. So if you notice the timing between the clock phases, phase one and phase two, they're never high at the same time. And again, this is known as non-overlapping clock. And, and there's a dead space. I show it uh, with this dashed line here. This gives us that break before make timing that we were looking for. And that's called non-overlapping clock. And I'm going to show you how to generate that right here. There's a couple ways to generate it.
probably the most common way of generating a non-overlapping clock. You have a single clock coming in here, but then you set up some logic gates where the output of a one logic gate is fed back to the input of the other logic gate. So this cross coupling is done such that an output that's already low can only transition to a high after the other output has already gone low. That, that gives you that break before make. Now, you also want a little time gap in there. And that's what these inverters are in here for. Those give you the delays. And you know, if we look back here, there was a, a delay between phase one and phase two, where that delay is basically set by the propagation through these inverters here. And you know, if you need a longer delay, you just add more inverters to this string. OK, so uh, today I, I talked about the charge pumps and the associated circuitry needed to make them work. And these are very, very common building blocks used in many, many analog circuits. So I hope my talk today has been helpful. And as always, I've included a glossary at the end of this document if there's any terms I use today. So thank you very much.